Okay, well, welcome everybody. Um, this first presentation is going to be current trends in asthma part one. And in this presentation, we're going to talk about the pathophysiology associated with the asthmatic patient, to find what is asthma and describe the epidemiology prevalence, and then also to find some clinical endpoints when treating the asthmatic patient. So let's start out as what is asthma? So asthma has been around ever since mankind has been around, and it's been uh, recorded uh, back in the earliest, earliest periods of time. Uh, the term asthma actually comes from the Greek verb azenia, which means to pant, to exhale with an open mouth and sharp breathing. Um, and in, in the actual uh, Iliac, which is a Greek epic, epic poem attributed to the great author Homer, um, described during the siege of Troy, he, he, he basically described the expression asthma for the first time. So that's the first time asthma really appeared in the written text. In the Corpus Hippocrinium, which is a collection of ancient uh, Greek medical works, it's the earliest text where the actual word asthma is found as a true medical term. Uh, we are not sure if it would meant asthma as a clinical entity or more as a symptom of a bigger type of disease. But Hippocrates said that a spasm linked to asthma was more likely to occur among carpenters, uh, tailors, and metal workers. So one could argue that even early on, there was this uh, propensity towards an occupational type of asthma. Uh, Galen, who is you know considered to be the greatest re uh, physician of ancient Rome, described asthma as, as bronchial obstructions and treated with owl's blood mixed in wine in his post-operative patients. Galen, interestingly, when you look at his historical perspective of asthma, uh, believed that the center of the body was not the heart, but actually the liver. Now, uh, Bernardi Razzazzini, back in 1633-714, uh, he's known to be the father of sports medicine. He was the first really uh, Italian physician that kind of really looked at the importance of exercise and what diseases were be prevented from exercise, but also could be caused by exercise. And he was the um, detected a link between asthma and organic dust as individuals were running through the streets, especially when they were having bullfights, et cetera. Uh, he was the first to rec recognize an exercise induced asthma, that asthma could come, you know, the symptoms of asthma could actually occur secondary to exercise or inhalation of certain top type of uh, triggers. At the beginning of the 20th century, asthma was seen as a psychosomatic disease, meaning that it wasn't actually looked upon as a physiological disease, but more of a mental disease. And during the 1930s to 1950s, asthma was known as one of the seven psychosomatic disease that the disease originated in the brain and then caused the body a problem, not vice versa. And asthma was described as a psychological that was, um, it's really treatment was psychoanalysis and other talking cures and a child's wheeze, uh, as we, you know, inf infantile type of asthma was seen as a suppressed cry for his or, or, or his or her mother's milk. Uh, psychoanalysts thought that patients with asthma should be treated with depression. Um, eventually the psychological or psychiatric theory was eventually refuted and asthma became as known as a physical condition. And asthma as an inflammatory disease was not really recognized until the 1960s when anti-inflammatory medication, steroids, uh, oral steroids and injectable steroids became available. So that's kind of a little overview of the historical perspective of asthma. So it's not that asthma has been recently discovered. Asthma has been with us ever since man and womankind has been. So in 2021, the definition of asthma was that it's a chronic, long-lasting inflammatory disease of the airways. So this is kind of the current uh, belief. And in these susceptible patients, there's inflammation that causes airways to spasm and swell periodically, so the airways narrow. The individual, you know, um, may wheeze or gas for air. 
a structure to this airflow, of, you know, it, it maybe resolves spontaneously or, or need or responds to a wide range of treatments. But the thing that's important and one of the things that you need to stress in your practice or with asthmatic patients, that this continuing inflammation makes the airways hyper response to the stimulus as, you know, triggers cold air, exercise, dust mites, pollutants in the air, and even stress and anxiety. So what you really have to understand about asthma is if a patient is not having an asthma attack or have symptoms of asthma, it does not mean they don't have asthma. The inflammatory process is always there. No different than other inflammatory diseases like lupus, psoriasis, um, Crohn's disease, et cetera. There are per periods of remission, but the disease is still present. And that's very important. So when we look at asthma pathophysiology, um, airway inflammation, which is always present, airway, airway hyper responsiveness and airway obstruction. Now that airway hyper responsiveness, understand what that means in the sense that, for example, there's six of us in the room, all right? and all of a sudden a plume of dust comes in that room. Two individuals in that room may not even notice the plum, plume of dust. Two might, you know, cough, sneeze, be irritated by it, but just, you know, minorly. One person might start coughing a lot and really get irritated, but that sixth person may start wheezing, be short of breath, not be able to get air, and really be fairly sick. So that's what that means is that the, the individual with asthma, their airways are more responsive to the same stimuli that other individuals may not even know is present. And then obviously leads to airway obstruction. So when we look at a normal airway, there's a nice lumen, the muscles are around the airways are nice and relaxed and your mast cells and, in, and your eosinophil cells are where they belong uh, and your you know, they're, they're kind of around, but they're not, you know, in, in, in large volume. And your gel solator or mucus is pretty minimal. So this is the normal airway. During an asthmatic attack, especially, this is what happens. Just smooth muscles go into spasm. And you can see, you know, especially from interleukin number four, a cytokine, you can see the muscles are tight around the airways that decrease the lumen. This, this gel sole layer of mucus becomes increasingly increased. So you have mucus hypersecretion, which then causes decrease in lumens. So the lumens decrease not only because of the spasm, but because of the obstruction of the mucus. And then you can see that there's an increased amount of globiate cells being um you know, produced. And also you have a lot of this inflammation that causes other cytokines like interleukin-5 to be produced. So you have this cascade that one leads to another, which then leads to another, and you have a vicious circle occurring. And again, you know, this is another, you know, somatic. It gives you the idea that smooth muscles are relaxed, the lumen's open, the mucus is on the gel layer way, way. And then when you have the asthmatic, you have blood vessels become swollen, inflammation, and you have this lumen. You can see much easier to breathe through that type of airway than this obstructed airway. Now, mucus plug and asthma can be deadly. And one would argue that the majority of patients that die from, uh, have life-threatening asthma, which will be talked about in another lecture, is uh, this mucus plug in. This is a bronchial cast from, from a young asthmatic who unfortunately died from complete airway obstruction. And if you look at the casting, you can see the trachea, the carina bifurcation, and then the um, right and left bronchuses, and then the bronchioles. So in this situation, the whole airway became obstructed with this mucus plug-in. And some clinicians argue that patients that require mechanical ventilation or hospitalization with asthma have some form of distal mucus plug-in, not just bronchospasm. Now, it, it's interesting because we can't really subjectively totally 
um, you know, objectively measure someone's shortness of breath. You know, shortness of breath is a very much of a subjective versus an objective. You know, it's just like pain. Some people can have a high pain threshold, others a very small pain threshold. And that's that's the same with asthma. So when someone's saying they're having a severe asthma attack, they can't breathe, you know, you can't, you can't, you can't say, well, you look like you're doing fine, because that may not be the true case. And a child's view of asthma is quite interesting. So here's, these are some drawings and picture. So this is one child that when they're having an asthma attack, it feels like there's a rock on their chest and they can't breathe. So that's, the, that's, that's one view. Uh, here's another view uh, of a young um, teenager is they feel like there's a thunderstorm or a, a tornado going on in their lungs. There's, there's all this like energy inside the lung and it's so hard to breathe. Uh, this was a five-year-old who, you know, and interestingly, is um, had dumped her um, goldfish jar and saw what the fish looked like without having been in water. And she then said, this is what I feel like when I have an asthma attack. I feel like the way his fish looked uh, gasping for air. And this is another. So you can see these these visions are quite dramatically quite dramatic in, in, in trying to express what an asthmatic feels like doing an asthma attack. And yes, obviously being like, you know, stuck between a rock and a hard place and being, you know, not being able to breathe. So and again, this is another one, uh, just as a young adult. So these are pretty graphic representations on the subjective feelings of asthma. So, when we look at asthma, we look at the asthma epidemiology, all right? How many people in the world have asthma? 10% um, of the world population, which is now billions and billions of people. I think we just went to 4 billion uh, recently. So that's a lot of people. Um, also, over the last decades, there's been an increase in the amount of people who seem to have asthma. And, and I don't know if that's truly you know, the case but maybe in terms that asthma is more recognized uh, more frequently, and that's why there's this increase in it. But we'll talk more about that. It's more common in males, but it seems to be a little bit more lethal in females. And this is always an astounding number, and this number remains constant over the last decade, that about 3,500 deaths per year in the United States. You would think in you know, the current period of time in, 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 in you know, the 20th century here, we would be able to uh, prevent asthma deaths, but there is a still over 3,500 deaths per year. Death rates are higher with older individuals because they usually have other comorbidities and admission and death rates are always higher in lower social economic groups. And we'll talk about that more in detail in a minute or two, but asthma often is referred to not just as a physiological de disease, but also a social economic disease because individuals with lower social economic status have more exposure to asthma triggers. Again, in the United States, there's 24.6 million uh, patients diagnosed with asthma. Uh, almost half of them experience asthma attacks. 1.8 million go to emergency rooms. And again, uh, almost a half a million are hospitalized. And then, as I said before, you know, you're looking at some 2018 data, pretty close to 3,500 asthma deaths per year. And then almost nine uh, people die from asthma each day, each day in the United States, which again is horrific, uh, considering that you would think we could control asthma with all the information and, and interventions we have. And when you look at the cost of asthma, it exceeds 20.7 billion annual healthcare dollars. So it's a very, very expensive disease, not just in the sense of the terms of, you know, um, hospitalization, but the lost productivity, uh, lost days at work, school, et cetera. And as you increase the level of asthma, mean as you know, you go from a mild to moderate severe, the cost really impacts dramatically. You can see, you know, with with uh, severe asthma, you pay a lot more than with uh, moderate to mild asthma. But still, even mild asthma, when you look at that cost per year for medications and doctor visits, et cetera, 
I mean, that's bad. That's a chunk of change, too. Now, some argue, as I said earlier, is asthma and social, economic, or race disease. Some people argue, mm. yes, it is. And um, and you can see, here's a boy, poor African-American young boy, and this is the condition he lives in. And one could circle mm. about 10 different aspects right here of triggers of asthma. We'll talk about triggers in a second. But when individuals live in squalor environments, the chance of mm. having one uh, uncontrolled asthma and having an increased asthma triggers increases dramatically. And when you look at the data, all right, and you can see is that when you look at race and uh, ethnic back, uh, background, you can see that again, you know, certain groups have a higher propensity towards um, the percent of asthma. When we look at Hispanic of uh, Puerto Rican origin, 13.3% of that population has asthma. Um, at that point. So, um, and, and if you look at now asthma mortality, when you look at red ethnic groups, you can see that um, African Americans, Black, non Hispanics, they they have a much higher uh, death rate, you know, per percentage than some of the other groups. That you know, overall is fourteen point one. But when you compare African Americans with the other groups, they are way way higher. You know, sometimes threefold, fourfold higher. And then this is the same thing with, you know, inpatient admissions. Um, African-Americans are much higher, 30% compared to whites that are only 8.9. And, and same thing with office visits, things like that. So obviously, um, race and ethnic background plays a role into this. And interestingly, it's not only the social determinants and inequities in healthcare play a role, but there's also biological factors that make African Americans a little bit more have a higher propensity to have an asthma. Um, for the, you know, and interestingly, when you look at a group of um, African Americans, Puerto Ricans, and Mexican Americans, and they looked at the response to most of the asthma medication, that for some reason that um, African American have rare genetic variances that are associated with a decreased response to albutrol. So, um, albutrol is one of the front rescue inhalers and one of the mainstay uh, therapies in asthma. And if these individuals don't respond to albutrol, they may need other therapies that are more expensive or more difficult to get. So this may play a role too, not just the social uh, determination, uh, determinants and in, in inequities, but also a gene pool. Now, th there's no doubt about it that there continues to be racism and policies that discriminate against African Americans, and also again where people live. You know, people that live in poor housing are exposed to asthma triggers, mold, higher levels of air pollution, uh, dust mites, and even and even cockroaches, all right? So there's a whole plethora of reasons that may explain this, but the problem lies in that you need to take this in, in account when you are dealing with the asthmatic patient. Now in, in Pennsylvania, this is kind of older data, but this is where we live, you know, where I live at this point, you can see even in, in Pennsylvania, uh, this data remains very true. Where you look at the African-American population here in the black line shows that, um, in, I'm sorry, in the, red, in the red graph line here, shows that there's an increase in um, African-American asthma, per 10,000 compared to your Caucasian, 
and Hispanic and non-Hispanic groups. So, you know, that information is not only consistent throughout the country, it's also consistent where, you know, where I, you know, I practice and, and live. Um, now, when you look at, at other factors like age, by far the majority of asthmatics that visit the ER are young, which makes sense because their airways are smaller and their parents get very panicky when their kids are wheezing and can't breathe. And that actually kind of decreases through and st stays pretty low uh, throughout life. It, it peaks up a little bit during the teenage years. This could be associated with exercise induced asthma, but really by far the zero to four years is, is the highest group. However, you reverse this when you look at death by asthma. You can see that uh, there's very little death uh, within the first 20 years and a moderate death uh, from 20 to 40 years. But then when you start getting up above 35, it starts going up and obviously above 65. And again, the reason being that at the age of 65, there's multiple other comorbidities associated along with asthma besides just airway obstruction. These people have heart disease, they may have COPD, they may have lung cancer, uh, morbid obesity, et cetera. And when you look at all age groups compared to female and male, and this is again in, in Pennsylvania, you can see that early on, males are more likely to have um, asthma. And as you then move through, uh, females kind of go ahead. And then at the end there, you can see that um, females, especially age 65 and older, um, this is, you know, this group here may be postmenopausal, and there's been some discussion that um, as female go, become menopausal, it changes the har internal hormones, and they become higher risk for what's known as intrinsic asthma. Now, this, this slide, I think, demonstrates real nice um, about the prevalence of asthma and mortality throughout the world. So you can look at the proportion of population with asthma on this graph on the left, and then case uh, fatal, you know, fact, uh, fatally per 100,000 asthmatics here on the right. And you can see that fatalities here is, you can look at Wales has a large amount of individuals that have asthma, but their death rates are pretty mild. But you, then you go to the Russian Federation, there's not a lot of asthma document, but the asthma that's document, they have a high, high mortality. Almost 40% of all asthmatics die, um, you know, 40, 40 out of 100,000, which is much higher than some of these other areas. Now, asthma triggers, and one could argue, you know, it's very hard to stay away from an asthma trigger. As we said earlier, there's exercise induced, there's pollen, so certain types of the year based on what uh, vegetation is blooming, uh, puts, puts some uh, asthmatics at risk. Uh, bugs in the home, uh, we, you know, we know cockroaches and dust mites are extremely uh, detrimental. Uh, their drop-ins are what ends up being the trigger. Chemical fumes, hot, you know, deodorants, um, cold air. Uh, this is something that bothers my lungs is when the temperature drops below 20 degrees and it's frigid outside, I inhale that cold air and I get somewhat of a uh, bronchospasm and sometimes even, even inconsistency where we go from warm air to cold air quickly, that can have a negative edge. Uh, fungal spores, dust, uh, secondhand smoke, uh, strong odors, again, perfumes, animals, uh, pollution, we'll talk a little bit more about that, anger or stress. So when you look at that, yes, you say to yourself, how can you not have asthma? It, you know, you know, because there's triggers all around you. Unless you live in a bubble, what are you going to do? And then when you start looking at it, so the people that, again, inner city, a lot of pollution, a lot of stress, wild animals, bugs in the house, you know, cold because they can't afford heat a lot of uh, uh, dirt and dust, and then there's a lot of individuals that smoke in those environments. And then you can have foods, shellfish, um, certain type of uh, sulfites, preservative, nuts, all right? Colds and infection, this is another trigger for me. Okay, if I get a viral infection, 
all right, like a flu or something like that, you know, that'll cause me to get sick. Air pollution, smoking, dust mites, weather changes, as I said. And, it, you know, it, it it might not even be that cold. But if, it, if you go from a 90 degree humid day to a 70 degree dry, dry day, that can cause emotions, you know, positive and negative. Laughing too much, crying. You know, a lot of people get asthma attacks at wedding, not because they're stressed out or or sad, because they're really happy and the laughing and, you know, enjoyment can cause attacks. Pollen, molds, uh, fungi, exercise, animal danders. This is one of the problems with children to have asthma. Unfortunately, they have to get rid of their pet because the pet is a trigger. Um, and, you know, medicines and then, as I said, hormones. And so, again, you know, you look at this and you say, how as an asthmatic can I live? Because I'm surrounded with it. Now, the role of air pollution, and I show you this picture, and one would look at this and say, who the hell wants to breathe this air in? Uh, the role of air pollution and asthma may be one of the reasons why there's an increase in pre prevalence of asthma, too, is that our air that we breathe is just not as healthy as it has been historically. So when you look at, so this is where, where I live in the Lehigh Valley, and this on the um, top X here is the different levels and classifications, and then the activity that people that, you know, school children should do, okay? So for example, if the air's good, there's no restrictions um, for athletic practice, outside events, physical activities, whatever, recess. If air is moderate, then you already start seeing as yellow individuals who are usually sensitive, unusually sensitive to the ground level, ozone should limit intense act activity. So this would be your, asthmatic COPD people. Then when you get to 150, it's unhealthy. So you get these ozone warnings. And again, it's, it includes make indoor space available for children with asthma or respiratory problems. And then they here, sporting events and athletic training, they should not be out there for long periods of time. Then obviously unhealthy or very unhealthy. But in the Lehigh Valley where I live, there was 120 days in 2018 that the that the air level was above 100. It was in this group. So almost a third of the days, the air was not healthy for people who have respiratory problems like asthma. So this could be, you know, our air is getting dirtier. Uh, there's a lot of concern about climate change. So this could have a factor in the increase in the amount of asthma. So that's kind of an overview of like a little bit of historical perspective. Um, you know, when we look at the epidemiology and we look at, you know, some of the triggers. So now like, how do we diagnose asthma? How do we know people have asthma? Because shortness of breath is not an uncommon uh, symptomology. So one of the most common is if we watch this algorithm here is, you know, we look at this as patient presents with respiratory symptoms. You know, you look for, so they, you know, the clinician looks for recurrent uh, episodes, symptoms, symptom variabilities, does something cost it? And then does something take it away? Or it only occurs these days? You know, other try to make alternative diagnosis. Does a person have lung disease? Does a person have CHF? Then you kind of record the observation of wheeze, look at a history of allergies, and then you actually look at objective data, which is either peak flow or FAV1. So if you have a probability of asthma, code as suspected asthma, and then you kind of look at an initiation of a treatment, okay? If you give some kind of a bronchodilator and the patient seems to do better and have a good response, well, then they probably have the de definition of asthma. If they give a medication and they don't have a good response, then let's try to test for airway obstruction, do spirometry and then bronchodilator reversibility. And look at things like challenge tests. You can do um, methacholine challenges. You can look at tests for in eosinophilic inflammation by looking at exhaled NO levels, doing blood uh, esophage, uh, uh, eosinophil levels, and then do skin prick tests, looking at uh, in, enumological uh, mediators like IgE. Now, again, try to look at, this is probably suspected asthma, but if there's no response and 
um, you you know you don't see these values here, then most likely there's a low probability of asthma. So this is a nice systematic flow chart to follow. Um, again, this is when you look at spirometry, which is the the key is look at you know what is the um, FEV1, FVC, if it's less than at lower limit for normal age, or is it less greater than for normal age? Okay, but they have basically symptomatic. Okay, you want to actually do a trigger. You want to create a trigger in this arm, so you give a methacholine challenge and re and repeat the spirometry, and then you end up seeing that the patient now has um, a response to methacholine, and they probably have asthma. Here, you give a methacholine, nothing happens, then they probably do not have asthma. On this arm, okay, you basically give a bronchodilator, repeat the spirometry. If you have an increase in FEV1 by 200 milliliters or it increases by 12% from baseline, that means that asthma. So these two here, the blue box, the blue circles would indicate asthma. Here, you would have to look at an alternative dose, an alternative dose. You give a bronchodilator, nothing happens, uh, then they probably don't have asthma at this point. So again, this, this is, uh, you know, spirometry is still the stand, going standard to determine objective status uh, regarding the asthmatic's uh, uh, objective flow rates, FEV1. Now, um, in 2018, there was a classification. So there, so there was a lot of classification of asthma, you know, intermittent, mild, moderate, and severe. And you know, I, I put this up here because this has changed uh, dramatically over the last few years. Is so when you look at this again up at the top of the of the uh, x axis, they break in. What what does intermediate mean? And then on the y here, what are the symptoms? So if you have symptoms that are less than uh, two days a week versus symptoms that are throughout the day, that that would make. And then it would be based on your PFTs and that stuff like that. So again, and then down here. It also makes recommendations on what kind of therapies. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because this has been changed over the last few years. But this was the this was in 2018. So um, we'll talk about what's going on now and in the past. So I'll just you know I'll stop at that 218 and we'll go back to that chart in a in a minute or two. So asthma, as I said, has been around for a long time, and in ancient times. You know, they looked at this as um, albuma gracium was known as dog poop. Uh, these, you know, these, these dog feces were usually mixed with honey and misted in the airways to treat uh, airway redness and asthma attacks. I'm sure we wouldn't do anything like that, but that was something that was done um, back in the, um, you know, before um, Christ was born back in the, you know, the early Greek times. Uh, as I said, owl's blood mixed with tree nectars has been very commonly used over the years because there was a belief that the owl being a wise animal mixed with these uh, tree nectars could act and open up the airways. Asthma cigarettes were very common in the 18th and 19th century that contained medicines or herbs. Some of them had belladonna, some of them were atrophine, and others had herbs, but you can see um, joy cigarette, immediate release of asthma, wheezing, and winter uh, cough uh, at this point. So a lot of these asthma cigarettes were very common to be used uh, early on. Asthma nectars uh, made out of different type of herbs or tree type of nectars were very commonly used in uh, Europe. Uh, this, is, this is from Germany. This was an early atomizer to deliver these nectars. Uh, here's an early nebulizer. This is a uh, permission from Felix uh, being used. You know, you'd put the nectar in there and then it would steam out. So currently the global initiative for asthma, GINA, all right, is really the going standard when it comes to asthma manager management. And I showed you in 2018, what the classification was, but 
in the last few years, that's been changed as we've got more evidence and we've got some other drug options available. So in 2018, this was the stepwise approach for managing asthma, is if you were at step one, so let's say you have intermittent asthma, short act and beta agonist was the only thing you got. Then if you were at kind of like mild asthma, you would use a low dose inhaled steroid. And as you had more asthma symptoms or your symptoms were more refractory, then you started add on other type of um, medications or interventions. And here, this would, when you got to this uh, step five or this, this high level, this is considered to be refractory or difficult to treat asthma where alternative uh, interventions need to be added where your conventional therapies like inhaled agents or even um, oral corticosteroids like, you know, prednisone aren't effective. You have to think about other stuff, which, you know, other interventions, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. So 260 million people globally in 2019 and, you know, Gina characterizes asthma the same way I did in the sense that, you know, wheeze, chest tightness, variable expiratory error limitation, reduction in peak flow or FEV1. And then people can have uh, exacerbations, which can be fatal. Now, remember too, um, any asthmatic, no matter if they're you know, considered to be mild, intermittent, or whatever you want to say, can have a fatal asthma attack. Because remember, even if you don't have symptoms of asthma, overt symptoms, you still have constant reconditioning, remodeling of your airway and inflammation. And most of mortality and morbidity associated with asthma should be preventable, and particularly with the use of inhaled corticosteroids. So what's moved from is using these rescue inhalers to now using inhaled corticosteroids because we know asthma is inflammatory. And even when there's not symptoms, the asthma is still causing inflammation. So Gina no, rec you know, no longer recommends a short uh, actin bronchodilator as your pre preventive type of uh, asthma. The only time they recommend that is for exercise induced. They now recommend that all asthmatics, may it be mild to severe, should get some form of inhaled corticosteroid because that is now the gold standard. Um, because again, you know, we can't, and the definition of mild can be somewhat arbitrary also. So again, you know, th th the problem with Gina was there are many different, different, different definitions of mild asthma. Okay. So now is asthma that is able to be well controlled with a reliever, a long or low dose inner cortical steroid. Okay. But again, Patients with so-called intermittent asthma are still at risk of severe exacerbations, and Gina has planned to review the definition as time goes on. But um, the, the point being that it's better to use an inhaled corticosteroid as a preventive measurement instead of you relying on a rescue inhaler. So again, p p patients that are, quote, mild asthma, um, 30 to 35 percent of asthma people with mild asthma have acute asthma. 16 percent with mild asthma have near fatal, and 15 to 20 percent dying of asthma supposedly have mild asthma because you don't know what's going to happen with unpredictable viruses, pollens, and pollutions. So these individuals that have you know a certain trigger, if they're exposed to that trigger for either a lo long period of time or for a large voluminous amount of it can run into problem, all right? And, and the problem is, again, these corticosteroids sometimes cost more than the, the um, rescue therapy type of inhalers uh, and they get more rapid relief uh, quickly, but really the S, you know, again, the, the current therapy for mild asthma is inhaled corticosteroid. And again, this is now looking at the uh, GINA current data, and you can see preferred controller is as needed, low dose inhaled corticosteroid. And then as you go up the ladder, 
you start adding things. Again, you don't start using um, these beta, you know, in inhaled beta agonists until you really get to step three. And it's always in conjunction with um, your long acting bronchodilators. It's never just um, in conjunction with a short acting one. It's always long acting. Now you can use your short acting one as a rescue inhaler. I'm not saying not to use that, but what I'm saying is please, if you have asthma, think about using a inhaled steroid as your maintenance and using your SABA or your, you know, um, rescue inhaler only as a rescue inhaler. It shouldn't be your first line of defects. And then when you get to step five, again, you start looking at other interventions. So again, this is uh, in the adult. And again, you know, you look at symptoms less, you know, less than twice a month, symptoms uh, greater than twice a month, but less than once a day, symptoms most days or awakening with asthma at least once a week, symptoms on awakening and, you know, low lung function, this is poor FEV ones. And this is really patients that have uncontrolled asthma despite conventional therapy, they have uncontrolled asthma at step five. Now, most asthmatics should have an asthma action plan, a plan that really helps gear the patient to daily compliance and maintenance of their asthma. And it's very, very important because the provider and the patient need to work together with this. So when the patient's in the, in the green zone, their breathing is good, they don't have any symptoms and they have unrestricted um, work or play. And they may, in this case, take, if they exercise, they may use a rescue inhaler, or they wouldn't call it rescue inhaler, a maintenance short acting bronchodilator for exercise induced asthma, but not for symptomatic asthma. Now, when you get down to this caution area, uh, there's evidence of a cold, they're sneezing, feeling congested. They know they were exposed to trigger, you know, next door neighbor uh, cut a bunch of grass and it flew into the yard and caused it to wheeze. They don't feel well. They wake up at night coughing. Uh, you know, again, what medicines are they taking, how much and how often? And then maybe it's time to call and say, hey, look, I don't feel quite so good. Do you recommend me maybe increasing the dose or maybe what, you know, should I get some oral prednisone on board here? And then when you get into this range, that means the medicine is not helping. Breathing is hard. Uh, you, you have evidence of uh, sensory muscle work, nasal flaring, um, and you can't talk in to complete sense. Now you got to take these medicines and call your doctor immediately. And often the doctor will say, go to an emergency room. So every, every asthmatic should have an asthma action plan that is uh, specific for their peak flows and for their levels. Now, there is a massive array of medications for the asthmatic. Um, when you look at standard therapies, you have both short acting bronchodilators and short acting um, anticholinergic you know, antagonists, and then you have your controller. So this is kind of your standard therapy. Now, based on the type of, you know, it, it, maybe it's allergic uh, asthma, you know, like extrinsic, they might uh, recommend a leukotrin receptor antagonist or uh, a, a synthesis inhibitor, okay? Um, we'll talk about more in a second, like Singulair, you know, those type of drugs there. And then there you have your long acting bronchodilators, which are often, you know, always used these days with a corticosteroid, your combination drugs. And then you start looking at other therapies. You look at oral corticosteroids, biological that look at preventing uh, both immunological and, and leukotrin response. And then you can actually have an intervention called bronchothermoplasty, which we'll discuss in a minute or two. So you can see this is kind of the, the major medical therapies for stable asthma and adult in the sense this is for stable and then this would be more for refractory down here. And this is a chart that was given to us from the, uh, you know, the Chess Foundation and the College of uh, Asthma and Allergy Network. And you can see it. I mean, there's a whole plethora of 
different type of choices here when it comes to asthma. Um, you have your whole list here of short actin, you have long actin, beta agonists, uh, you have inhaled corticosteroids, combination, anticholinergic, and then you look at your um, biologicals. Uh, we're going to talk about a lot of this in detail. And the bronchothermoplasty, which is actually an, an invasive uh, procedure that, that uses heat to the airway. And then you have the old uh, phospho inhibitors like the offlin and stuff like that. But you can see that why patients get confused on what medications they're on because you have to have a thesaurus and a uh, work manual to try to figure out all these different drugs and the side effects. And some of them are difficult to use. These, these spin inhalers are not really easy to use or flex inhalers. So you also have to gear this to, uh, my mother-in-law was put on, um, God bless her soul, years ago, a uh, inhaler in, or I'm sorry, a twist inhaler and she, she didn't know how to do it. And it took me a few minutes to figure out how to do it. So you have to understand if you're a provider and you're given, you know, you're ordering these medications, make sure one, physically they can do it, two, cognitively understand how to do it. So let's just look at some of these different actions. So beta agonist therapy is the most common. There's short actin beta twos, there's long actin beta twos, and there's ultra long actin beta twos. And the idea is that the beta, beta 2 receptor will increase the amount of cyclic AMP, which then blocks the inhibition of calcium, which is known to cause bronchospasm by smooth, increase in smooth muscle uh, constriction. So what you do with these, you increase the cyclic AMP, which then blocks, so and that opens up the airway and dilates. And so it's actually a direct dilatation at this point. Um, you, you know, again, you know, what you're trying to do with some of these new drugs, so just real is a newer drug where it can actually give you bronchodilatation for a whole 24 hours. And this would be an example of an ultra long one that can actually open up your airways. So you only have to, have to take medication once a day versus every, every four hours, uh, et cetera. And if you look at, you know, a short, a moderate and a really long on, on how this works is, this is a rapid onset, okay, because, and, but it's not stored in the lipids, so it breaks down quick. This formortal is a rapid onset, but it's retained in lipids, so it lasts longer. And then salmonitrol is a drug that is retained, but it's a slow lipid diffusion. So again, this would be nice for maintenance. This would be nice for a quick response, and this would be for a moderate maintenance, but this is how the beta-2 agonist kinetics work and how these drugs, why these drugs are different because of how the medication is stored in the lipid airways of the fat. Uh, theophylline is a phosphase inhibitor and it's been around for a long period of time. It was very much uh, in vogue when I started in respiratory back in 75. And then it kind of fell out of vogue because there's one, it's an oral medication and there's a whole gamut of side effects associated with it. But the idea is that these, these uh, theophylline and Xanathec derivatives try to prevent what is known as phosphodiosterase, which would break down your cyclic AMP. So if your cyclic AMP is reduced, all right, it will help, you know, it'll cause bronchospasm. So it helps block it helps maintain your level of cyclic AMP, but it also blocks your GMP, which is your bronchoconstriction mediator. So it works in different ways. So this is why this can be beneficial. And you take this Q12 hours and it can, it, it can help patients. But again, there's a fair amount of side effects. Um, there's, you know, there's uh, CNN, people can, uh, CNS in the sense that people can get, um, uh, very edgy, very nervous, uh, nausea. Some people have insomnia from it. Uh, years ago, there used to be a kind of a medication that had uh, theophylline. It had some fenugrin and it had some uh, Valium in one to try to prevent some of the side effects. Uh, but people then abused it for the uh, fenugrin or for the Valium, unfortunately. Leuc Leucotrin modifiers help prevent 
and it interfere with actions of triggers and muscles. So the idea is if someone, let's say, is allergic to hay fever, you know, you know like hay, uh, ragweed pollen, and they go into bronchospasm, the idea is to prevent that trigger, the leukotrin 4 or 5, that then would cause the bronchospasm. Uh, it, it's not to be given for relief, quick relief, so it's not like a, you know, a rescue therapy. It's a daily medicine that has to be uh, maintain and have good compliance. So again, you look at just allergen, may it be um, cold air, uh, whatever it could be, uh, exercise, you know, uh, a medication, sulfide of oxides, and you get this release of uh, this acid, and then these will either block this or block these lutetrins. And the idea is by blocking these mediators, you can get Bronco, you 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 block you block bronchoconstriction and maintain bronchodilatation. So if you can block these uh, cytoleukotrins, LTC4, LT4, and LTE4, uh, you can prevent bronchoconstriction. Some of them work different. So Singulair works on this path. Um, Xylutin works on this path here. Now, I put this in with COVID-19 because obviously we had COVID-19 and there was a lot of concern that um, individuals that had asthma, if they got COVID-19, it would be a death sentence. But um, it does not appear that, uh, again, COVID-19 really um, increased the chance of death with patients that had wild controlled mild to moderate asthma, okay? And overall, there wasn't an increase in death rate associated with COVID-19. And, you know, the argument was uh, the implication for this is make sure that during a pandemic, you adhere to all your medications you're supposed to and really make sure compliance is good. So you reduce the risk of severe exacerbations. And there's no evidence that there's been increase in asthma exacerbations during the uh, COVID pandemic. So this was kind of good news. Now, I do hear on some ads for COVID medication that asthma is a risk factor. And I think asthma can always be a risk factor for any type of um, respiratory or viral infection, may it be influenza, may it be RSV, may it be COVID. But the bottom line was, if you have good maintained asthma, um, COVID didn't seem to make a, a, a change in mortality or morbidity, which, is, which was very comforting for me who has asthma and works in the ICUs. Now, let's talk about treatment of refractory asthma. So this is asthma that is at step five, and we really have a lot of problems getting rid of, okay? So you're looking at asthma that, you know, does not respond to your bronchodilators, uh, doesn't respond to a lot of type of other interventions. So we got to look at some other stuff here. So one argues that five to 10% of these patients who have asthma have what's known as severe asthma. They're at step number five. They continue to have symptoms despite the standard care medications. And often as you go up these steps, you use more oral steroids, you use more bronchodilators, you use more inhaled steroids. You also have one more expense more adherence means that you have to keep track of these medications more, and obviously there's more side effects. So additional therapeutic treatments are needed. Um, again, you look at something called bronco, bronco, bronchial thermoplasty, which reduces airway smooth muscle. So again, when you look at the asthmatic airway, they have this thickened smooth muscle around it. So if you can actually burn that muscle down a little bit, and prevent just hydrophobia of the muscle, you can have um, increased dilatation. So really you have this hydrophobic type of muscle. So what you're gonna do is try to burn it away because it's remodeling of the airway. And it's an outpatient procedure. Uh, usually do a bronco, uh, they do a pulmonary function study prior, and then they are gonna deliver controlled energy to the airway walls. and there's studies that have shown that uh, it increases asthmatic control and it increases uh, relative quality of life in patients with severe. 
um, you it's not a cure for asthma and you still have to, you know, use your maintenance drugs like inhaled corticosteroids and et cetera, like, you know, maybe single air or theophylline, but you have better response to those medications, less exacerbations. So this is the allyl catheter. This is what it looks like. And this is the uh, frequency controller that controls one, the duration of the um, time the actual catheter applies the energy. And then you can also control the temperature that you're applying it. Temperature is between 65 centigrade to 180 degrees Fahrenheit. And it's basically delivered to the airway walls for about 10 seconds. And there's no evidence of permanent damage to the, the actual epithelium of the tissue. And what they do is they do it in three procedures, um, three weeks apart. And what they'll do is like procedure one, they'll do this part of the bronchotracheal tree. Procedure two, they'll do this part. And then the last procedure, they'll do this. And again, they usually, as I say, it's outpatient, it's done with sedation, conscious sedation, um, patient's not intubated for it, conscious sedation. And uh, then they, they're in the hospital for a few hours for observation. They do a bronchial, they do a PFT afterwards to see if there's no evidence that this caused more obstruction and the patient can go home. Uh, we, we have done this for years in our, G, you know, in our bronch lab and uh, we, we've had some real good successes. Example would be, this is in, in, in a dog model where um, the, this, this bronchus here was treated with a thermoplasty and this one wasn't. You can see the improved airway lumen. So when you actually irritate the lung, this lumen stayed open and was responsive to bronchodilatation where the one that wasn't treated stayed very closed. Now, the biologicals in asthma is really where asthma management's going. It's not treating the symptoms of asthma, but actually getting a handle on the actual cause of asthma. If you look here at the right-hand part of the screen, I know it's a busy slide, but you look at what, these are the different therapies we use conventionally or, or considered to be standard therapy. Corticosteroids inhaled, anti-leukotrins, and your inhaled agents. And what do they do? They try to reduce airway inflammation, decrease airway hyper response to this, treat bronchial constriction, and prevent airway remodeling. That, that's what we're trying to do. But again, as I said earlier, the asthmatic patient continues to have these problems. So you look at your biological therapy, and if we can use things like Zolaire and some of the newer ones out, you can actually block these responses at the cellular level. This is very similar to what you see for psoriasis. This is what you see for Crohn's disease, where you're now blocking. So you don't get to this point. You block the mast cells from degree granulation of inflammatory meteors like histamine and leukotrins, the cytokinic proteins. So the idea with this biological therapy is treat the actual cell of the tissue and prevent any of the mediators from being released. And if you do that, then you won't have to worry about this because you have control over what's causing these things. Now, there's a plethora of problems associated with biological therapy because what you're asking the body to do is to prevent its natural immunological response, okay? You know, to prevent, you know, this, this is trying to prevent the body from, you know, being in bad situation. So that's why you have the inflammatory. But one could argue asthma, like a lot of other disease or autoimmune diseases, which the body is overactive with. So if you can block this overactive response of the mast cell, the eosinophil cells and the T2TLC2 cells, you can prevent all the asthmatic symptoms. So again, one of the most common and, 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 and longest biological out there is Zolaire. Um, it binds with the circulating IgE and it prevents this cascade of edema and release of uh, leukotrins and other type of mediators. And it's, it's, it's administered subcutaneously uh, for every two to four weeks. 
and the patients on a dosing level based on their weight. And, um, you know, they could get anywhere from 30 to 700 uh, units, depending upon it. And um, it's very expensive. It, it, it will cost anywhere between 541 to 2,706. It's now covered by most insurances, but it's this price is much higher than the cost of conventional therapy, obviously for asthma. There's side effects. And again, remember when you're blocking the immune system, um, you're also going to open yourself up for other problems. Uh, there can be rashes, there can be joint pain, front bone fractures, uh, joint, you know, arm, extremity pain, nausea, dizziness, tired feeling, ear pain, cold symptoms, stuffy nose, sneeze and sinus pain, cough, sore throat, and you may be more susceptible to other type of viruses. And if you get vaccines, they may not be as effective because you're blocking your immune response, your body's immune response. There's newer drugs out there. Um, Trizemaline, okay, is an inflammatory, um, it is another monoclonal antibody, but it targets the inflammatory uh, protein. Uh, this is, again, um, there were studies, and this is in a phase three, and this was subcutaneous. So, um, it seems that this worked fairly well. And then just recently, uh, this was just a few weeks ago, this has been now released to be um, used for patients that have severe um, asthma. So it's actually um, Tezospire is, is the name of it. And, and again, it works the same way in the sense that it blocks these um, receptors, it blocks these biological responses. And again, patients that a lot of patients had uh, rashes, itching, uh, sore throats, and back pain. There is some studies that show that high flow oxygen and acute asthma may be very, very helpful. Um, that the high flow may stent the airways and reduce the amount of auto pupil, plus the warmth of the humidified air may be somewhat helpful and soothing to the airways. Patients that look at, you know, where um, Borg scores, which you ask patients how short of breath you are, the higher the Borg score, the more shortness of breath you are, uh, was reduced and the, the, the respiratory rate was reduced out. So patients with asthma that were put on high flow were less tachypneic and had less dyspnea and less uh, stress-free muscle work. So that's part one. You know, we tried to review a historical perspective. We kind of gave a little bit of history on, you know, some of the early asthma treatments. What is the current asthma treatment? What's the ep uh, epidemiologist? And, you know, well, how do we treat somewhat um, refractory asthma, not life threatening asthma, but refractory? So I'm Ken Miller and I have asthma and on a given day, I continue to have symptoms, you know, despite taking conventional therapies. So we use things like um, these biologicals and thermoplasty is, is available. So again, in conclusion, historically asthma has been problematic. Uh, there is a plethora of asthma triggers. Currently there's an array of asthmatic medications available to treat and prevent asthma symptoms. So this concludes part one. Um, hopefully you'll be able to, um, Listen to part two later um, in your series.